Welcome to Mew. Today's episode is with Roger Thisdill. Roger is a longtime meditator and practitioner who comes from the perspective of pragmatic dharma. Through his work and insight practice, Roger has realized a highly defabricated state of consciousness that features a permanent sense of centralistness. So instead of the experience of there being a single epistemic agent at the center of experience, Roger instead has a much more non-local experience where all of the content of consciousness or phenomena of consciousness are all self-cognizing in, of, and through themselves exactly where they are without referring back to a epistemic agent at the center of experience. Now, what's so interesting or meaningful about this is that it has led to a tremendous increase in his baseline of well-being and a dramatic reduction in the amount of suffering in his life. In addition to these practices of defabrication that are a movement towards awakening or enlightenment, Roger is also interested in providing and constructing detailed phenomenological accounts of both the mind and of consciousness, ultimately with the goal of reducing suffering for sentient beings. This podcast explores all of these topics. In it, we get into suffering, the nature of suffering and its relationship to resistance and contraction. We explore the process and project of defabrication and how it is that we might defabricate our own minds in the direction of permanent centerlessness. We explore the jhanas, how it is that we might move through the jhanas and practice insight through them. And we also explore a particularly interesting theory of valence that Roger has, where he posits that there doesn't actually exist any positive valence, like pleasure. Rather, there only exists negative valence and its attenuation or diminishment. Connecting with Roger was a lot of fun. It's really a rare opportunity that I get to speak with someone with such a rarefied and interesting experience. And Roger also has a tremendous amount of wisdom from all his time on the cushion and from spending so much time exploring consciousness. And so it was really a fun and valuable conversation for me. If you're interested in Vipassana and awakening and enlightenment, I think you'll also love it as well. And so with that, I'm very happy to introduce this interview with Roger Thisdill. Welcome to Mew. It's really great to be speaking, Roger. Uh, This is a question that I asked recently in another interview, but I'm also interested to get your take on it. And the question is, what is suffering? I've thought a lot about this. I think suffering is, I kind of take on a monoaxiology ethic here. Suffering is the one metric of value and it's the problem in the universe. It's the only thing that matters. No, nothing else matters in life as opposed to how it relates to suffering. If there were some configuration of atoms and they could change in a way that had no causal impact on the suffering of sentient beings, then it, there's no value judgment that can be made there. That's what I believe. Uh, phenomenologically, suffering, I think, is directly correlated to a sense of contraction and contraction is to consciousness what sandpaper is to skin and just for there to be any conscious experience there must be some form of contraction some binding of information and so where there's experience there's some form of suffering and the only moments of pure freedom from suffering the way i define it is with the cessation of consciousness what is contraction contraction is I think one of the subtlest identifiable parts of experience and some synonyms to it are tightening a hardening and inpulling. We know contraction somatically in gross ways in the body through inflammation and um, a sense of heaviness and, and stress. The opposite of contraction rather is expansion and that is the, the unbinding of sense impression, sense phenomena, the de-reification of objects in the mind. And this creates a releasing an outwardness, defabrication. I think resistance is 
linked to, doesn't have to be, but a sense, I think a lot of people would think about in this way, a sense of agency and a sense of efforting and not allowing of the flow or the stream of things, of experience. You can have a sense in which you feel like you've lost the sense of agency and you're really not resisting experience. You're trying to let it flow and yet there's still still hiccups in experience. There's still contraction. As long as there's still experience, there's some minute form of contraction because contraction, this, this binding is what reifies experience in consciousness. So your perspective is that to have a unified bound experience of consciousness requires at least some meaningful contraction between sense faculties and our world modeling or world simulations such that it's like contractually bound into a unified experience. And so some suffering is inevitably goes along with that. But to the extent to which we're able to defabricate our experience is the extent to which we can achieve freedom from suffering. And part of this seems to be like getting rid of what you call a modal perception, which is sort of like seeing things as very solid and contracted, whether it's like the body or the mind or the world. And there's this other facet to this, which sounds like it has to do with the movement of energy unimpeded or unfiltered or unrestricted by resistance or contraction. Yeah, yeah. And if it was totally unimpeded, it would fall out of the experience. There'd be no binding force in order to have any understanding of experience at all. On the amodal front, almost, I think as you awaken more, there's a, a down weighting or a, a down regulating of amodal perception. And amodal perception isn't just a, it's a noticing of contraction, it's parts of experience that aren't directly perceived but are heavily inferred. So, for example, when you see the face of a building, you are only seeing the front of it. And yet in your world simulation, you interact with this building or you perceive this building as if it is a hardened 3D structure and it has depth to it, it has an interior to it, it has more walls around the corner, even though none of that's in your direct experience. But a model perception is this, this heavy inference sort of in, in some way, letting the, the mind know that it lives in a 3D hardened structured world. When we meditate more, we get, we sort of climb down the ladder of abstraction and we're able to perceive our experience in a more raw fashion. And this downweights the a model perception. You can see, oh, there's just color and seeing as a type of sensory experience on its own, decoupled from thinking or feeling, the, the color has no weight to it and no depth depth to it. And uh, by training, you can decouple the, the sense modalities. So one facet of this that I'm interested in that maybe doesn't have a clear answer is why is it that contraction or resistance is synonymous with suffering or directly produces suffering? I don't ultimately know why contraction entails suffering, but I can compare highly contracted states from much less contracted states, much more defabricated states in which eventually your sense of a body schema starts disappearing from experience, uh, models of selfhood start disappearing, understanding of a greater outer world outside of direct experience starts defabricating and like such information is just no longer like being represented in the mind anymore. And then ultimately taking this defabrication process to its conclusion where space and time disappear, unbind, no, are no longer represented in experience. And then there's a, a pretty night and day difference between more mundane states of highly con constructed and contracted states and there's more defabricated states in terms of affect and valence. The, the latter, there's a lot less suffering going on there. What, one facet here that I'm interested in is some, you know, mystical figures like Jesus, for instance, say something like the truth will set you free. So there's also the sense of there being a necessary relationship between what's true and then also freedom from suffering. So again, like in Buddhism, samsara can be understood as a sort of like a false perception of what's true. And so like we're not perceiving the three marks of existence, which are suffering, impermanence, and no self or emptiness. And so we suffer to the extent to which we're perceiving incorrectly. So do you think there's something about resistance and fabrication and contraction that has something to do with it not being in total alignment or congruence with what's true that makes it a facet of the nature of suffering? Yeah, it could be. I mean, I do lean on the side that actually 
we are coming to a deeper truth, at least phenomenologically understanding better the kind of internal mechanics of consciousness and the, the, the qualities of all of this sense data. Yeah, they're all being empty, impermanent, and not ultimately the, the true self. And, you know, as you train and your like ability to sort of process information gets gets faster yeah, there is this sense of less I impedance and you're less hung up on each prior moment and so you allow it to to come and go and drop away and you can move on to the next moment and at the same time you're registering more experience and with more detail and it experientially just creates this much more flowy fluid experience of life so how do we begin defabricating our experience? How do we uh, deconstruct the contraction or how do we cease to participate in resistance that continues to reify both the sense of self as well as duality? Yeah, ultimately by not feeding these mind objects with our attention. And you can start by just on the surface level of the body, sort of noticing t tension that you're holding and relaxing it and releasing it if you can and then you, you you notice that common element of relaxing releasing that can be done at subtle and subtler parts of experience so you know the really gross level is just constriction in the body clenching your fist and you can release that anyone can do that but there's subtle ways in which we're holding tension in our mind stress and being hung up on certain thoughts and you can release those thoughts and notice that, relax, relax, release, release. And it's a really subtle process of noticing when the mind is focusing on something and just letting go of it, letting go of it. Noticing, you know, eventually you're noticing space and you just move attention off of space onto a, a kind of nothingness and, and have it hang, attention hang nowhere. And the, okay, the more you train, you can do this at subtle levels. And then that process becomes automatized. And there's one way in which you can just set the intention and let it rip, and the mind will start doing this on its own. So I'm curious how that fits into a stable sense of awakening, like an abiding awakening, because the practice, right, is something that's intentional and it, it needs to be sustained. So does that convert itself into a passive change that doesn't need to be maintained through a practice? Right. So yes and no. So there is a way of sort of running through the defabrication path and going through the jhanas, for example. It's like a series of altered states. At each one, there's less and less mind content. Someone who's technically not even like reached the first stage of awakening, first path or stream entry, which is like a big sort of milestone in this journey. Someone who's before that even can go through the jhanas, but then when they come out, they're back to normal existent, normal hardened, lots of amoral perception, lots of suffering existence. And they didn't get the, the long lasting integrated insights along the way. So actually what we want is to notice, yeah, the three characteristics, these qualities, like we'll notice, uh, talk about emptiness in at kind of all resolutions of being, even in really deep fabricated states, but even when you're just not meditating, walking around life, you just the apparent emptiness of everything is can become very stark. And I think there is a it's like a Goldilocks zone to hit between sort of fabricated and defabricated states, but you maintain productivity and ability to function in the world. Okay, so there are also a lot of different paths that are described by different practitioners, and these may suit people of different types more or less than others. Could you describe your path or what you would describe your path as? Yeah, so I mean, I didn't follow any particular tradition, but I'd probably say I've like been most influenced by like the prad pragmatic Dharma scene, pr pragmatic Buddhist scene, which is heavily inspired by Buddhism, yet focuses less on the religious aspects. And my approach to this is I've just I've s sort of started really interested in exploring like altered states of consciousness. So I would do lots of different meditation techniques to get into different states and try to learn a lot of tips and tricks along the way by experimenting with lots of different types of meditation. I'm like a pretty conceptual thinker. I study philosophy, but I think something that came to my advantage was going into a lot of this having not been so primed or influenced because I had read books or listened to teachers beforehand. So I would kind of uh, venture out into uncharted consciousness waters and then after the fact try to sort of 
rationalize it and conceptualize it and understand it. I think that served me well. But yeah, I don't know. It's been a, it's been a long journey. And, and, and the sort of the place and how I understand things now is so different from when I started. So let's talk more then about how it is that we might defabricate our experience. So you just gave us one particular practice. I'm curious if you could explain more of the you know mechanics of that, the different kinds of practices on offer, and I guess like the perspective of inquiry that one takes when one is engaged in defabricating one's experience. There's also like the seeming tension between like the intellectual understanding of these things and then the, you know, the direct experiential understanding and what's required to bridge that gap. Yeah, you've got to learn to be able to shut that off and stray away from sort of just always having the linguistic languaging sort of part of the mind online is a, a time and a very vital time and place for that, but you've got to be able to learn to drop that as well and see, and see its limits. The way I frame this, and I think there's a few maybe discrepancies between schools, but ultimately I think there's certain cognitive faculties you need to strengthen, those being concentration, attentional clarity, metacognition, and your noticings per second, like how much can you notice, how many arisings and passings of phenomena can you notice per second, you can speed that up and equanimity and there's different meditation techniques that will train one of those more so than another one for example mahasi sidal type noting practice will really really work your noticings per second and your metacognition and then with these strengthened cognitive faculties these are the tools you use to inspect the model this world simulation model that we all inhabit and you can see with more detail oh this thing that i thought was like a core center when i look into it with enough concentration so i don't lose it and enough detail so i can really get the specifics on it and i can see it fast enough and i can i have the metacognition to know that what state the whole being is in while I'm, I'm doing all of this and not be lost in like the semantic content or whatever, you notice that, hang on, it's not a thing. It's not a thing I thought it was. It's made up of other parts and all those parts are appearing and disappearing rapidly and, and, and all those parts are hollow in nature. So could you describe the path and stages as you see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm almost like reluctant because I've definitely been primed to see kind of like a Theravada type or path stage model, but I'm not beholden to it. And I'm very open that there could be a different rubric here or different, like, or people have different paths or, or it's like, not everyone's gonna hit these milestones in this order, it could switch around. So yeah, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I think, I think ultimately I would like us as the world to do a lot more research on this you know there's so many schools of thought so many different types of practices i mean it's one thing to be able to get those different schools communicating with one another and comparing notes and then there's also like clinical and scientific research we could be doing to get more objective empirical data on what is going on here yeah so maybe if we put a bunch of salt there then like warn people that it's just one particular interpretation then maybe that would be helpful if you're interested in sharing i think there's a sense of you know people tend to have a need to want to locate themselves on the path and then also to know like what it is that they should be doing and like my experience in practice at least like the techniques that I find to be fruitful tend to diverge somewhat from, you know, what you or Daniel Ingram or someone like Frank Yang talk about, where there's like a lot of long sitting and like Vipassana or body scanning that's used for deconstructing amodal perception or solidity or sense of self. Someone who I do really appreciate is Adyashanti, where like the path is like very holistic and it involves a lot of qualities like telling the truth about everything or surrender in ways which also seem to be powerfully deconstructive to the sense of self. As much as you think Jesus fits into the Theravadan four path model or whatever Buddhists are talking about in terms of awakening, he makes similar claims about things around like surrender and will 
that aren't, I don't hear talked about as much in terms of Theravadan Buddhism. So he said, not my will be done, but thy will be done, which is a sense of non-local will or non-local agency taking over, which would be a movement towards defabricating the sense of separate self. And then he'll go on to say something like, looking at myself and my father are one. And that's kind of getting closer to a sense of non-duality. So, you know, what's your perspective on the path given these different kinds of like mystical figures and to be frank, and maybe that's unfortunate, but I think perhaps like these are just different avenues of development. I mean, I, I quite like Ken Wilber's model of wake up, grow up, clean up, show up. And you can work hard in one of those avenues of development while totally neglecting another. And I mean, it'd be really nice if there was like a one-to-one -one correlation with ethics and awakening. It doesn't seem to be the case, although I think you know, I'm, I, I care a lot about ethics. I try to tell only the truth. That's an ethic of mine. And I sort of actually thought this, I think my ethics is only partially related to my sort of progress in, in meditation in one way. I think, I mean, I've always cared about ethics. Like I've, I've been vegan since I was 18 and that's before I ever started meditating. Like just through philosophy, I was convinced of the ethical arguments there. And in some way it becomes easier to stick to your moral principles when you're suffering less, because when your well-being is more secure, you care less about things going in a particular way and you it frees you up to consider other people more and, and how you're affecting them. It's funny the the, the non-local will and the sort of local will you framed it. Yeah, in some way, I feel like uh, maybe maybe I said this to you before, but like I think there's a maturation process in which your personal desires and your care for the collective will unify. And again, I think sort of maturing and growing wise in this way is not necessarily linked to awakening. You do see those come apart. You can see people who are not that mature, but maybe have like really deep insights into emptiness. But, but I'd recommend work on all of this, you know, become a well-rounded human being. Yeah. So it's totally true that there appear to be people that are seemingly awakened that also uh, do lots of unethical things. So I actually don't see these practices as necessarily being practices of ethics, though I can also see how ethics fits into a practice of awakening. I would construe some of these facets as actually being like intelligible in the framework that we were talking about before around contraction and resistance being synonymous with suffering, because in many of these cases, it's actually just contraction or resistance to what's true. And that may be true of what it is for you to do next or how it is that you believe you ought to treat other people. So like, for example, in, in like in Adi Ashanti's paradigm, the perspective is that if you're not telling the truth 100%, then there's like a sense of resistance to what's true. And so in so far as you're doing that, you're still in resistance and contraction in terms of like forming the sense of separate self. So like when you tell the truth, it's not necessarily an ethical thing. It's actually just ceasing to be resistant. And so there's a quality of that allowing you to embody what you've awakened or realized as. And so like, I think of other paths as well. Like I think of like in Advaita Vedanta, I think like one could argue like how deep one's realization goes and if they only make it like part of the way. But like similarly, like some of the inquiry and like the devotion practices there and like the surrender and telling the truth, moral components, they all, I still think, seem to have this like facet or quality of surrender or resistance or, or giving up resistance. So yeah, that's my, some of my like confusion about trying to square these like different paths. It, it would, I mean, it would make sense to me the, if you, you know, you still got this sort of subject, other duality, and you, you really see the other person as, as an opponent, as an op opposition, you feel like you have to manipulate their understanding of reality by, by lying to them because you're ultimately scared that how they could hurt you and you're still thinking of, um, yourself as a, as a separate entity that you want to continue living. You want, you want it to survive and, and persist. Yeah. And it, I, I see the logic. I get it. So you've spent a lot of time uh, meditating, it sounds like. And so, you know, what is your experience at this very moment, given what you've defabricated? <laughs> yeah. So I can talk about like, just like anyone else, like there being a subtle, like tingle in my right shin, there'd be a sense of warmth under my right shoulder blade and those kind of things. But all the while 
these things are perceived as very airy, sort of like ghosts in some way. They're not, none of this is like fully bought into in the way that it used to be. There's one thing is the, the sense of a sort of unified body schema is like permanently downregulated a bit. So there really just is this, these apparitions of sort of cloudy clusters of sensations sort of in different parts. Some of the interesting phenomenology is I, I live life with a sense of permanent centerlessness. So there's no longer the sense of a, a single epistemic agent, like this one knower in the center of experience, who is like the ultimate knower or conductor of experience or controller of experience who has agency. Like that's just gone. I used to also feel like I was in kind of some kind of bubble structure of the mind. There's my experience and it's like a contained space. But now that I've sufficiently decoupled, I've got the insight to decouple sense perception from somatic sensations, this like breaks down that sense of a barrier. So everything is kind of thin and there's a sense of, it's like, it's funny to talk about like the insight into like, like non-duality and everything being unified as like, yeah, I understand this perspective, but those are signals in the mind. That's like a message that can appear. There can be a feeling quality of, oh, it's all one. And that's just an uh, appearance that can appear or disappear or just cease to be represented. And the same for selfhood, that there is an I. You can have a signal that I am this, I am that, or I am everything. And it, in some schools, in fact, the, the end goal is to get to a point where you feel like the God mind, that, oh, I am everything and you identify with everything. And that's a perspective I've inhabited and I understand that, but that's just a signal that is itself empty that can appear and disappear. The same with not identifying with things, the signal that I am not that, or I am nothing as an active signal that can be generated in the mind, again, is an empty signal that can appear and disappear. And so what's left when both of those signals, the I am and the I am not signal are just not appearing. There's just kind of no question about what I am. It's not, it's not a feeling quality of being something or not being something. There's lots of other core phenomenology I can talk about. A sense of expansion and contraction could be noticed at a, a, like a gross level, but it's, there's this constant pervasive effervescent fizz of micro expansion and contraction happening. And again, seeing the emptiness of expansion and contraction itself, where you get this superposition of, of, of those simultaneously. And then you, you sort of get to this, like reality is neither something nor nothing kind of perspective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there's not a whole lot of suffering going on compared to before at least. Yeah. So why don't you, why don't you, why don't you talk a little bit about the, the, the valence and the suffering going on for you? So, I mean, what suffering there is left is still like contracted body parts. That's like the most salient part. Just this, this is a sense of like, uh, still like a heaviness in existence. I mean, it's a lot less heavy than it used to be. I mean, it used to also be that again, with the sense of the body schema, people perceive they really have this hard body and there's this inference, the amodal perception of not only are there sensations, but there's meat and bones and all this stuff happening, but you actually don't perceive that you don't have nerve endings in like a lot of places in your body. There's just these somatic sensations. So I can still feel sensations. And I think most people wouldn't call that suffering. They'd be like, look, I'm sitting in a comfy chair and actually it doesn't feel so bad. But when I compare it to experiences of the higher formless jhanas or even cessation, lights out, no consciousness, it's like, oh yeah, this is comparatively, this is suffering. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not complaining. <laughs> I want to I want to put a pin in that and talk about uh, cessation and, and formless jhanas and uh, true nature at some point. But for for right now, um, I just the last thing I'd like to touch for you to touch on is in terms of the positive valence. So you talked about suffering right there, but for an experience that's like much more defabricated than it used to be, talk about the you know the positive valence characteristics of that. Yeah, so I think I've got a bit of a controversial opinion on this and that I don't really believe in positive valence. I think there's just negative valence and then the attenuation of negative valence. And the thing that we think is the good stuff, the real good stuff, is actually just that releasing of prior contractions and comparatively noticing 
less suffering. So an example like a massage feels really good, not because of the imprint of certain sensations in your back. It's actually because by pushing in what was once contracted about, you know, yay much becomes contracted less so. And that there's a there's a an obvious comparison. You have to perceive this really quickly to notice it. But if you don't, you just think, oh, the sensation is what's good. But no, 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 it's actually this subtle after the fact releasing of the sensation. I think just it's just a simpler framework and you can still, it still has all the same explanatory power. So you can see this as there's just negative valence and then the attenuation of negative valence and it's, it's disappearing. You don't need this third extra positive valence end of it. So a lot of experiences people think are pleasurable I actually think is them not perceiving the experience sort of in a fine grain detail enough and they're still they're still like because they're missing key detailed in the moment parts of that experience what's actually they're like attached they become attached to the experience because they're still under a certain delusion that no, there must be like a good, there must be something pleasurable, like an extra, extra added positive part of experience to experience. And if you don't pay attention enough, you, you miss this fact that it's actually, that all sensations are unsatisfactory. And then you'll keep like going back to experiences that, that have a lot less suffering in them. And by comparison, you think they're good, but actually there's a lot less suffering. I can give the massage example again. I guess I'm like very confused by that. <laughs> it's a it's a, it's an interesting theory of valence. Why don't you go ahead and give the massage example? Yeah, so a lot of people would say like massages feel good and there's like this new added part of experience, the one rubbing your back or pressing into your back. And with this added part of experience, that's the good bit that feels good. But actually, I think what's happening is it's just releasing deeper contraction. So you actively contract part of the body and right after now it's less contracted than it used to be. And people will then compare it and say, oh, this was a good thing. This felt good. But if you pay enough attention, it's just, it's still just the, it was, it, you know, there was pain and now there's less pain. And comparatively, that's an improvement. But the somatic sensations, any kind of sensate experience can't add something extra and positive to experience it. They're all unsatisfactory. They can never, ever complete you. I mean, there's a phenomenological answer here. I, I think there's perhaps a, a neuroscientific answer, which I'm, I'm not really credible to talk about, but just we look at like, you know, what are the, the main neurotransmitters that equate to our well-being, like dopamine and serotonin? Well, okay, I'm not really credible talking, but my understanding is like serotonin is just a neurotransmitter inhibitor, which just blocks pain signals. So that's not like adding something in some way that's just taking it away, it's just blocking pain. And dopamine isn't actually giving you something new that is cherishable and good. It's just motivating you. And I would think evolutionarily, you wouldn't need to create a pleasure system. You could just have the pain system and then it's released and, and a, a motivational system that says, if you do this, you will get something good. And as long as you're tricked by that sense of, oh, there is a prize in it for me. Okay, therefore I'm going to be motivated to do this thing. That's enough as it is. You never need to actually receive that prize. That's a thought. What's coming up for me is I think I can like understand your motivation for this, though I'm like somewhat skeptical of the claim. You also have like way more meditation experience than me. So like maybe there's some I haven't noticed any some some particular qualities of consciousness carefully enough. But, you know, in terms of like Advaita, they would say something like the awakened state is Satchit Ananda, which is like being consciousness bliss. And, you know, if, if we incorporate like the Qualia Research Institute's perspective, like perhaps like the natural state is like symmetry and symmetry is what positive valence is. And so as you subtract suffering, you are subtracting contraction or asymmetry and you are like revealing the naturally positive state, which would also be sort of in line with, you know, the Buddhist perspective that nirvana is not separate from samsara. The sun is always shining like behind the clouds. And that's also, you know, congruent with like Advaita Vedanta perspective of the awakened state being Satchit Ananda. Yeah. I like that actually as well, that what you said, revealing 
kind of the already peaceful, pleasant good. What I'm speaking against is this conventional understanding that there is actually something to add to experience. Like you can put a cherry on top of experience that is desirable, that has value in itself. There's a sense that when you when you cling less and when you defabricate less and you go to Nirvana or cessation or lights out, there's a recognition like, oh, that was it. That's all I ever wanted. And that all I ever needed was just like, I just don't want to suffer. No one wants to suffer by dint of what it is to suffer. So yeah, I totally understand what you're what you're pointing towards. The pro the process of awakening definitely seems like it's subtractive rather than additive. So there's nothing that like you need to be adding to consciousness in order to reach states of you know less suffering or nirvana or awakening or however you want to put it. How do you fit in the perspective of like if you just take a bunch of MDMA, then that seems to just be putting a cherry on top. <laughs> and I've run yeah. this experiment. <laughs> okay, go ahead. No, sorry, I'll let you finish. No, no, yeah, so have you run this experiment in your current defabricated state? No, not as I am now, but I in the past I have taken MDMA and then meditated and tried to look for the good part, look for the good stuff. And what you get is like hot flushes, more energized consciousness, so things are more vibrant and sort of more sensations and ripples throughout the body and all these kind of things and perhaps more synchronized ebbs and flows of somatic sensations, thoughts are more expansive and smoother. But you can't, in all of that, there was nothing to find that I could pick out and be like, yes, this is the good thing. This is the thing that is worth holding on to and I want to stay around. And it's like, no, all of this, you know, I could, I could let go of all of this and it'd be even better. So, so this is like insight into the nature of everything is, is dissatisfactory. Unsatisfactory, unsatisfactory. And sort of just to pass a distinction there, that being, it's that no sense no qualia has the possibility the capability to ever satisfy your your like satisfy you to your soul even for a second it just doesn't it's not it's just not a quality that it has but we're under a delusion that we think it does that one maybe one day there's something we can experience that will just like fill our soul and people who kind of keep going back to experiences or become addicted to experiences because they think yeah this is the good experience Experience it is fulfilling my soul. I think they're not perceiving that moment clearly enough. They're actually like just out of touch with the present moment. And so there's like a retroactive, they're like they're trying, they're looking back on a previous moment, thinking like, oh, was that it? Was that the good thing? I just missed it. And like thinking, oh, I got to go back to that. But they keep missing that that moment. All of this sounds sort of like I'm maybe very pessimistic and sort of not in favor of um, having a good time and enjoyment. But I, I, I am <laughs> because I think while we're living in fabricated states, we want to live in, in beautiful fabricated states and ones that are harmonious and helping other people. What is this like void at the core of the soul that is always yearning to be completed by some sensory experience, but, you know, due to the samsaric nature of that is never quite fulfilled? And, and like, what is the remedy to that? It seems like it, it has something to do with realizing true nature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's because it's a some like knot or part of experience in, in which perhaps the oscillatory vibrations of expansion and contraction don't go through each other at that point. They clash at some point and that can represent itself as like a knot in the center of experience that's just irksome. And that little bit of bothersome experience is like motivating a lot of what we're doing in life it's like i just something's not right and i need to like and people don't know to that it's there or spatially located and so they're trying to like do things out in the in the outer world to to deal with this sensation to deal with this issue and you gotta you gotta untie that knot you gotta get to a point where there's no sense of a of a center here and it's just a, a, a very much more flow experience. And also the, the, the disidentification process that there has, there is some being here at the core that needs to be satisfied, that, that is incomplete. Once you recognize that there's nothing in experience that is, is the true self, it's all models upon models upon models, then there's no one to be satisfied. There's no, there's no sense of completeness nor incompleteness because 
what you are is a hive mind. You know, there's just lots of parts in communication with each other that have like different roles and function in different ways, but there's no central command center. All right, so let's uh let's let's pivot a bit here and 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 make it uh, a little bit more practical. So what I'm basically interested in is providing, you know, I guess, practice or technique or insight right now for you know how anyone that's listening might be able to defabricate their experience. So I'm curious what the best way to proceed with that you think might be. Like we could do like a 20 minute guided meditation or you could talk about different practices on offer. What do you think? Okay. Rather than give like a complete guided meditation, which would like be sort of slow in time, I'll, I'll say what I would say in a guided meditation and, and at a bit of a faster pace. How about that? So we could start by first establish your posture. So you want to find a posture that is secure, promotes wakefulness. So you're not like lying down where you're likely to fall asleep, but you're sort of upright. Preferably you want your knees lower than your hips because it supports the spine a bit better. But then you also want this posture to be very relaxed and one that you can get into and not move. And I think not moving is a really, really special thing about meditation, which like differentiates it from all other activities. Once you've established uh, a good, firm, dignified, upright, but relaxed body posture, then you can take a few deep breaths to kind of settle in a bit more, lower the heart rate. Then we might move through the body, scan through the body from head to toe and look out for any tension we might be holding that we don't realize. Like a lot of people uh, like fur furrow their brow uh, and don't realize it. And you notice that and relax it. You know, tensing your jaw, you can relax all these things. Shoulders relax, arm relax, and sort of really work your way through the body trying to relax more. And then, you know, you've done that once, go through the body again and try to relax even more because you can probably release even more tension. And so now we're dealing with kind of more of the gross contractions, gross distractions. We're also going to be quite isolated. So a lot of distraction comes from our thoughts about the outer world. So we want to designate ourselves a certain period of time, which we give ourselves permission to not have to worry or think about the outer world. Something we're trying to do is learn to go from a doing mode to a being mode, where you can like fully surrender and take your hand off the wheel and realize, I don't need to control this. In fact, eventually there is no control of this. It's just the universe is just doing its thing. Once we've sort of relaxed body sensations, then we might start, we could go into like a concentration practice, noticing the subtle expansion and contraction of the breath, either like at the nose or the chest of the body and by spending a long time on this we not only build our concentration power but we start like harmonizing ourselves and you could start like going into a trance like people like trance music because you get into like a trance state which is sort of a very symmetrical repetitive non-thinking kind of state of mind now the trance state is good for like annealing but if you don't have the metacognition along with this, then you, like, why don't people get awakened going to trance festivals? Because they're just, like, lost in that, that trance. It's like hypnotism rather than a meditative state. The meta metacognition is this cognitive faculty that's, like, tracking this whole process and is sober and is indifferent and just understands, ah, this being is cooling down, this being is like synchronizing more and more and more. And so we might start noting by applying like a, a mental label. This is where you can use part of the conceptualizing mind in conjunction with the meditation, which for most people is a big distraction, but here you make it the friend by start mentally labeling expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction and trying not to get totally lost and lose yourself in this process because otherwise we'll miss the good stuff. We'll miss like what's really happening. If you're not ready yet to lose yourself, then it's just like falling asleep or being hypnotized or something like that. So we need to, we need sufficient metacognition before we can we can go into it. Eventually at some point, once our concentration is sort of becoming more stable, we've got the metacognition going. We also need to be balancing our sense of relaxation and wakefulness, making sure we're not drifting off to sleep or falling asleep. That happens a lot to people in the beginning. But the more you practice, the longer you can meditate. It's, it's, it's like uh, when you first start running, you can only run for like 10 minutes and then you start running for 
20 minutes and 30 minutes and you do like a 5k then a 10k and you build up to this before you get tired the same thing we're working quite a lot our mental faculties and meditation and like if they haven't been trained you don't don't have the endurance you like get mentally tired uh, and we want to be awake for this and notice what's going on while we're noting we can start noting faster and faster and faster to build up our uh, noticings per second an issue a lot of people have with this is it kind of agitates the mind because then you're like sort of using a lot of mental labels and people find that kind of stressful like it's like you're thinking a lot which people think is supposed to be like antithetical to the purpose of meditation so again that's a slow process of learning to be able to speed that up without getting stressed we increase the rate of noting but you got to be careful that you're not like agitating the mind while doing this so there's a learning curve there to be able to increase it fast enough without stressing yourself out eventually you start noting so fast that you can no longer like keep up the mental notes because you're noticing appearings and disappearing so quickly that there's no time to even like label it because that's how quickly that you're noticing phenomena appear and disappear eventually at some point you will get to a stage in your meditation called equanimity where it becomes like effortless for you to sit it's just like things are really sort of smooth and uh, tranquil and at this point i think like you've done the work strengthening those cognitive faculties hopefully that now you can let your foot off the gas and coast and let your concentration and metacognition take you into what sort of they maintain themselves while you let your foot off the gas and you kind of go in from what was a very active kind of doing practice to now more being just like let things unfold and unbind by not sticking things with my attention not keeping them around and then in this equanimity phase if you've got sufficient metacognition and other things that's when you can begin doing like insight practice and start like pointing attention back at the self like who is the experiencer of experience or where are the sense of boundaries to the mind or is there an inside an outside or what is my sense of agency and you kind of like will look for this stuff in a non-conceptual way not to answer it with language but just try to gleam data with these uh, strengthened cognitive faculties and hopefully getting like more accurate data and you might have to do this just like hundreds of times but eventually i think there was a prior model you get sufficient amount of data and it realized that the previous way of understanding the mind was untenable and then the mind has to update itself to a new model Let's talk a little bit more about the insight stage. So once one has equanimity and one is, say, looking for the sense of self, there could be like an object of perception. And from that object of perception, you can notice the sense of there being a seer of it. So you go back from the sensation to look for that felt sense of seer, and then that becomes objectified. And through doing that hundreds or thousands or 10,000 times, the model of sense of self has to then update. Is, is that a right framing of this practice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I liked how you put that. And uh, I think what's missed like from a lot of people is actually like spatial references here like literally try to locate where in the experience space your sense of a center or a self or the boundaries are like literally find it in space and move your attention there although there can be uh, kind of more abstract forms of self like identifying with like a, a temporal form of self that, that you are a persisting entity uh, that, that you're the, the the you a second ago is the same you now that will be the same you in the, in the future. Right. So like looking at my experience directly right now, there's like a sense of self, like a cloud. And I can I can look at it, can look at like different facets of it. And then I can even go back from that and look for the sense of self that feels like it's looking at my sense of self. And through like a sustained practice of like bouncing between these perceptions, like a lot of time, this is a way that we get insight into no self. Yeah, it can be. There might be like a trap there where you think you're in like an endless loop where, oh, I think I find the sense of self, but then no, no, the real me is sort of behind that. What I thought was the self is looking at the self and then, oh no, I move attention back even more and it's like this recursive stream. But actually that's, that's, a, that's a trick, that's a trap. You know, it's just metacognition is the faculty that notices that, that recursive process. And then in some way you objectify that recursive process and realize like, hang on, that's going nowhere. It's like, um, do you know the, the Shepperton illusion? Just to explain it, it's like you take three scales at different 
know, you can't explain. I don't know music theory this well, but you play three three rising scales. Oh, um, like the in, the air raid siren. Yeah. So, or if you've played Mario sixty four and you try to to defeat Bowser before you've collected enough stars and you run up these like infinite staircase and it seems like it's going forever. If you get that reference, <laughs> um, where it sounds like it's just going up and 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 up. But actually, there's a trick there where they're just like looping the scales and they like overlap one another, so you don't notice the one scale like stopping and starting and, and repeating life is like the shepherdton illusion where we think it's like sort of going somewhere to completion it's like oh, where's it gonna go where's it gonna go where's it gonna go we're like where, where's it where's it where's it, where's it? <laughs> and you just need to recognize hang on mm. you know turn around you're only you know four you know stairs up and you're not getting any closer to fighting bowser this is going nowhere and you just notice that you just notice that cycle and you're like oh this is what it is this is what it's doing okay I see. I'm curious because this is somewhere I, I think that I struggle. What is your recommendation for someone who, you know, there's a sense of self and a willingness to feel it, not making the sense of separate self a problem? What would you do for someone who can sense the extent to which it's like a cloud of sensation that doesn't make up anything? And there's a core and you can like look at the core, but the, uh, sense of the core being like the self-feeling quality of the core is not defabricated is that just a lot more of this you know the practice we've been talking about so far yeah but you said something at the beginning there like they don't have so much of an inclination to defabricate the self or they're like thinking they're pretty happy living with this sort of core. oh no I, no 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 that's not what i mean i, I just mean willingness to experience it huh. like uh, i i don't mean not interested in defabricating they don't have a willingness to experience it? Or... No, sorry, they do. By, th by that, I just mean they're, like, not resisting it or, like, reifying the sense of self by, like, making it wrong. Like, people talk about the, the only thing that ever tries to get rid of the sense of separate self is the sense of self. And so there's a way in which you can, like, resist your sense of separate self. Yeah, that's why, like, at some point you have to learn how to, to go into, like, a being mode and not always being in a doing mode. And, you know, there's a lot of practice in doing that you do that you want those strengths to hold up over time. But when you get to, like, okay, let's just let go of every, everything and surrender. But I'm surrendering with, like, really good metacognition, really good sensory clarity, really fast noticings per second, like, on its own, because I've just, like, got the muscle memory there. Yeah, I think I'm just trying to get clarity about the insight practice in particular at looking at the sense of separate self. Yeah, it is this um, try to locate it in space and move tension towards it. And, well, it could be tricky because, yeah, there can be this, like, slippage that happens. That's why there's something to where if you don't have sufficient, like, clarity, you will look for the sense of self and think, like, I can't quite pin it. It's kind of vague and murky. And you won't be convinced that, oh, it's not. It's You're like, it's still there, but I can't quite clearly see it but once you've got like sufficient clarity on this you know it's like not a fault of your perceptual clarity it's like this thing is just vague and murky that's just what it is that's just that's just how it is and then you start seeing it appear and disappear when you've got quicker noticing per second so yeah i especially move attention towards it and um i mean this is for like defabricating this is like a spatial reference point or, or you can even try you test the viability of the model that the self is necessarily, uh, for a lot of people it's in the head, not everyone, but you can learn to move that center point and like move it to the chest or move it to the stomach or, or expand it or people have out of body experiences and those experiences become like a new reference point and call into doubt. It's like, well, how legitimately is it, am I here? when I know I've had experiences where I didn't feel like I was here. You know, this can be helpful. It seems like the core of it is a lot of direct experiential witnessing uh, with metacognition over and over and over again. And so it's not like an insight that can be kind of forced by the will, but is kind of like a an updating that happens from having seen so many times at a level that's like beyond the will. Yeah, yeah, you're talking about the will. It's interesting. I mean. My, my friend put it one way, it's just like, you need to exhaust like all possibilities in some way. If, if there is this really strong will, this idea that you can will yourself into freedom is at odds because that, 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 that will comes from contraction, which you know, 
creates the, the binding and, and the suffering. At some point, you've got to recognize that, oh, this project, there's too much to observe. There's too much going on. I can't be in all places at once. And life is so long that I can't constantly will myself into free. It's exhausting. It's like I can't hold on to this. At some point, you realize, yeah, it's like surrender is a good word. Like, oh, I give up. I, there's no way I can't stay on top of this. I can't keep living my life in this way, always trying to control everything, thinking of controlling everything just to stay afloat. There's this magical moment of just releasing and relaxing into it and recognizing that, oh, this does itself. This does itself. Yeah, I mean, you, you speak about will. You mentioned it a few times. It's interesting because one thing that drops off is the sense of agency. Yeah. The sense that really there is a freewheeling separate entity who can control some aspects of experience, which it just disappears at some point. And yet it doesn't change anything. Like you still function in the world despite not having this sense uh, that, oh, there is a me here who has to control things. It's interesting. Like my, my perspective on the will is that it's a way for the ego structure to maintain resistance because it's a way of exerting preferences over an empty, impermanent process, which can't, you know, always meet that will. And so it's a way of staying in separation and maintaining contraction because the sense of separate self is interested in, in like maintaining itself as like an energy pattern. So I'm just noting that I think that it's interesting that you said that in some part in this like inquiry path that you're discussing, it just drops off. This other path that I'm also interested in, it seems like if you surrender the local will or the egoic will to non-local will, then it has the same effect of it dropping off. It's just done consciously instead of via means of insight. And so either way, it seems like you still get the uh, falling away of some sense of separate self or like agency. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I like... Because there's, there's, there's a subtle way in which we can stray into metaphysical claims as opposed to just talking about phenomenology. And so it's like, do we want to get straight? In? The, the, the impression, the sense of there being agency and speaking metaphysically, no, there is actually like spooky physics at play here where something's uh, able to change directions or we could rewind time and do differently. Sorry, I'm confused what you're talking about. So I think for the most part, like the debate around free will. I'm not talking about stems free will. from people feel like, okay, do you want to I, I'm not making so any meta a little bit more. Than I'm not making any metaphysical claims like experientially there is like the egoic will. Um, and you're talking about how that can fall away at some point in the insight path. On the other hand, there's like phenomenologically speaking, there's a sense of non-local will, which is like the truth of what the moment is asking. And I think Jesus also speaks to this when he says, not my will be done, but thy will be done. And so you're saying that the you know sense of will falls away at some point through insight. And I'm suggesting that like, you can also relinquish it to the sense of like non-local agency consciously and immediately immediately. And that, that also has a sense of leading to the falling away of the sense of separate self. And this doesn't have anything to do with like there being free will or not. It's just like a phenomenological choice in the direction of truth and non-resistance that seems to have the same impact. And so this is sort of like in line with what I was talking about before about different paths. Oh, uh, yeah. Maybe it's a framework I don't know so well or understand. To, to I, I wouldn't want to like misconstrue it or anything like that. I suppose I the way I think about it is there's just kind of different drivers in us. I, I wouldn't just put like there's like the egoic will or like a, a higher will. Like there's just different parts that kind of like want different things that think short term, think long term, think locally, think collectively. And yeah, like, I mean, it's like a competition for like attention and stuff and like things, other things win out over other things. So uh, one thing we were talking about earlier that I wanted to put a pin in was uh, you were talking about even the sense of having a body in some sense is like contraction. And so like there is very subtle suffering, which is like not as good as cessation or formless jhanas. And then you also mentioned true nature. One thing I'm interested in is what true nature is. And you talked about, oh, I'm everything being a stage of awakening. One stage of this also seems to be like, I am consciousness or I am the witness. So like, 
at some point there's like mind body identification and then another point there's like identification with like consciousness or the witness itself now you talk about like cessations or maybe situations in which there's neither perception nor non-perception and the way that you know inquiry practice works into no self is that like any content of consciousness that you can notice by the fact that you're noticing it is not self because you can objectify it so you can objectify the mind the body the five sense doors the sense of self the reification of self as everything or nothing are also sense objects to be objectified. So, and part of that is that their nature is uh, that they're conditioned. So if they're conditioned, they arise and pass away and things which arise and pass away are not true nature. This is sort of a long way of getting around to the question of, you know, given cessation and, and given neither perception nor non-perception, which I don't know what that actually means or what that experience is. Could you talk about what you think true nature is and why it is or isn't awareness or consciousness real quick so what neither perception nor non-perception is like how to understand it is a state of mind in which your conceptual abilities has gone offline so you can no longer make distinctions between things it's like that there's still experience but a part of you that's able to judge left from right or this from that is just not online anymore so it's like a very murky weird hazy state and not a lot of like information gets embedded into memory that way and it's like you can't really talk about it the term true nature i never say that i don't use that so you, you know when people invoke this word true nature you have to ask them specifically what they mean but why is it not consciousness or awareness because okay w one way i've like sort of newly started describing the process of awakening is it's like experientially getting indirect realism so indirect realism is this philosophic position that we live in a world simulation and that we don't perceive the world directly in and of itself but we see representations of these things you can get that at sort of like one intellectual level and then you can get this in a way that it's becomes clear to you that nothing you're experiencing is a default objective part of reality that must be there and that there's always in existence or always maintains itself and you you see this through the deep application process what you thought was once something that's like really the world you see it disappear and yet sort of uh, you know experience remains and then here comes where it's like well yeah but once you've gotten rid of everything and there's still experience right well then this sort of ground of pure awareness or something like that then maybe that must be our true nature the thing is is i, I don't believe you can have an experience of pure awareness there were times in my life where i thought i had and i would have said it but with as i've sort of progressed more and sort of got more phenomenological detail on this there's still a subtle expression of space or time coming along with experience and uh, in buddhism they've got this notion of dependent origination or co-dependent co arising that you have there has to be a representation or awareness of something now we can conceptually think ah but awareness or consciousness is some special substrate some special substance that has a kind of materiality to it that this exists this is must be what the ground of being is that's a conceptual process and that's still any sense of, of you have to really inquire how thick am i thinking consciousness is am i really thinking it is some special substrate and you can see that thin out and thin out and thin out and recognize uh, it's just an idea there's no such thing here actually there's no container space that is really the world in of, of itself you never get to peer behind the curtain of consciousness it's all it's all an appearance to itself even this conception that we have a mind is is a, another representation i see i'm trying to like explore and interested in you know squaring these perspectives with other traditions which you know make different claims like in advaita vedanta you get a lot of discussion as true nature being self with like a capital s some like mainstream spiritual teachers like yeah like rupert spira or other people in that vein like maybe eckhart Tolle, Tol I don't know how to say his name, seem to reify true nature as awareness. And so what I'm interested in is the extent to which that's possibly a reification that can be objectified and therefore surrendered. And, you know, it sounds like in your perspective that it is. 
Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Um, I mean, I know there were. I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge debate, and I won't claim to have the final say on things. But I, there was a um, progress here in sort of noticing I was subtly construing consciousness as some kind of distinct, special thing, independent of things to be aware of. Yeah, and it it, it can't be. It's not. It can't be separated. That the things are aware in and of themselves. This is where I, I come down to. And then, and then there are, yeah, I mean, special cases of cessation or neurotosomapati where consciousness is superior. There's no experience whatsoever, no sense of isness, no sense of time, no sense of space, no sense of self. Really, there's nothing to say there. And then people think, well, if there's no experience, how do you know that you've had that experience? And you only know it from the ins and the outs. And you try to get some kind of more a third person sort of like reference here of like time, like my subjective sense of time totally disappeared. And yet I look at the clock and the clock has changed. You know, 10 minutes have passed, even though there was no experience to account for it. I mean, arguably, it could be that, oh, just your memory has failed you. You know, you, you, you were actually aware, but n somehow none of that information was getting encoded into memory. And now, like, memory's working again. Okay, maybe, maybe. I see. What is your advice on and perspective on practicing uh, jhanas? Um, again, I would uh, want to know where the person's coming from, where they're at in their practice to tailor the advice I give to someone. But I do think they're really interesting. So if, if no one has, if someone has never had any experience with, with jhanas, could you walk us through like you did before with insight practice, how it is someone might move through the jhanas? Uh, the jhanas are a series of like highly concentrated altered states of mind. So you need sufficient concentration and you need sufficient, they say to do the jhanas, you need to be free of certain defilements. And I take this to mean you need a peaceful enough mind so that you can really devote your like full attention to this. And you're not, you don't have any like traumas bothering you or coming up, or you're not distracted by anything uh, around you in the environment, you know, so much. And uh, you're not thinking about other things. You can really, you're at such a place in life and uh, with yourself that you can sit and fully devote your attention to this. Once You've, they often say you have to get access concentration before you can start going to the jhanas. Access, access concentration is like a really concentrated state where kind of you're, you're able to maintain your attention on the meditation object and sustain that for a sufficiently long period of time and you're no longer mind wandering or getting distracted anymore. From then on, hopefully you've got enough concentration to go into the jhanas. The first jhanas, PT, where you get these tingly sensations that are not unpleasant, people say pleasant, and then you want to start working with those sensations to spread them out throughout the body, and you get can, you can get some really nice currents of uh, sensations flowing throughout the body, and there's a matter of like building this and building this, and just focusing on this to the exclusion of everything else. Then from first jhana, that's first jhana, you've got PT flowing all throughout your body. And people have different standards of different criteria here to what sufficiently counts as jhana or not. Like how much of the jhana factor, the jhana object, is the totality of your experience or is not. So some people say well, it's sufficient that you've got just the PT all over your body, but you can still kind of have in peripheral awareness like some noticing of like sounds or something but others will say no no no. it's got to be full absorption full melting into just the pt there's only pt and nothing else happening from jhana one you can go to jhana two where the jhana factor is sukha or extreme glee or joy or delight and good way to do this is i like crack a smile a little bit and i get like a little and this kind of like tricks your brain into thinking you're happy and then you notice that happiness and then you like lock onto it and then by focusing attention on it you create like a positive feedback loop and you really get this going you get into states of ecstasy the barring drugs you will never be this happy in your life like really it's 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 insane how like much you can stoke that suka and you just you know i get into states where my jaw hurts because i'm smiling so much i look so weird from the outside but it's just like it's like head rush of like ah yeah yeah um <laughs> and then you don't want like yeah, you, know, you want people you don't want someone like walking in on you when you're in a really good second jhana oh 
you don't care. I mean, you're feeling so good that you don't even care. You don't care how weird you look. So. <laughs> oh, I've I've had my meditator friends comment on just how weird I look. Yeah. And then third jhana is like extreme tranquility, calmness, peacefulness. And to go from second, second is like really energized and you've still got like, if, you, if you've gone from first to second, you'll still have like PT. And then you can take a sort of deep breath out and try to like cool, calm yourself down and normally move my attention into the stomach. And I just get this sense of coolness, calmness and the sukha, the joy dies down, the PT starts dying down as well. And you get this like really cool, serene calmness uh, really really nice and that's a really good basis for defabricating i think once you get that's the third john and then it's like that's third john yeah i like that one to like really cool off and then from third to fourth so it's, fourth it's is, like you've annealed is, you've like annealed uh, your yeah. energetic system through one and two by like adding all this positive energy to it so now it's like the joy allows it to be like sus susceptible to insight yeah, that could be a good way of thinking about it, yeah. yeah. So, so then moving from uh, three to four? Yeah, and then from this coolness, you can kind of release that even more so, and you get to equanimity, which is like, in some way, even more peaceful than, than the calm. It's sort of more neutrality, just this kind of, it's almost a bit like robotic in a sense, just neutral, emotionless, without some kind of affect there. And at this point, something that can happen is your visual field can like whiten and lighten up and you can get the sense that you're just in this like totally still white realm. And now the body is really, really disappearing. Like th there's something to be said actually about a transformation of like state changes through the jhanas where like one can be like a gassy, like active, well, active fizzy state. Two is like liquidy. Three is like vapor. Four is like, okay, now it's like really gaseous and spread out the, the sense of the body. And yeah, at, at fourth jhana, the state of equanimity, that's a really good place to do insight practice from because it's like, there's no distractions going on. How did you move from three to four again? Yeah, it's hard to describe. There's a kind of, you can take a, like a little out breath and notice how you were kind of lingering on this calm coolness. I noticed that in some way objectify that and like become like really indifferent to it. Um, it's quite hard to describe the move, but it just uh, like, I don't know, just imagine you're just like, ah, oh, yeah. You're letting go of the third jhana. Yeah, you're kind of like, oh, cool, third jhana. And then just really like a robot, just really like motionless. Yeah, yeah. And, and continuing? Okay, so then from fourth to fifth, fifth is this sense of, boundless space so you in some way from fourth onward the equanimity is just the same and now you're just kind of playing with the dimensions of that space so fifth jhana is boundless space so however big you feel your experience space is you can start thinking bigger and expanding that pushing that out pushing that out pushing that out and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and wherever you notice this sense of uh, contraction at the edges, which is forming a boundary, dissolve it. You see its emptiness, you see its emptiness, you see its emptiness. And then that can stabilize and you get this to boundarylessness, which is somewhat similar to my like normal state, except there's like no content in there. There's no thoughts or, or, or perceptions or anything. And, and often that whiteness in the fourth jhana can go dark. And so it's more of like, a, can be like a black openness. And at this point, yeah, your sense of the body is really, really disappeared. Like there's just, it's just a boundless realm. You don't have this sense anymore that you are a meditator sitting on a cushion. And then from fifth to sixth is a move in which when you notice that there's boundless space and you're aware of that space, then there must also be boundless awareness and that this is all self-illuminating awareness itself and has that kind of quality. Um, sixth jhana is from where I, I currently sit because my default state is that everything is aware in and of itself. The sixth jhana is a bit lost on me now. Like, uh, it seems a bit redundant because it's like, well, obviously all of this is like where in and of itself. But if you don't have that perspective, there is a, a move to make. Then from boundless consciousness to seventh jhana is nothingness or, or no thingness. Um, and there's sort of semantic variation what's meant by 
if I know thingness. Because it's not like, again, nothing in the conventional sense of the word, which is really like nothing, nothing. It's that there's there's no discernible objects in this. So from sixth to seventh, that space collapses because even it's it's one step more defabricated than even six, where the sense of space was being held up. It's like this informational content that's being kept alive there, glued together. That comes apart, and you've just got this shrinks into this like infinitesimally nothing space. But there's still it's still an experience there, an experience of a kind of nothingness, of a, a gleaming of. How do you how do you make that move? It's so hard to describe, but there's a way in which you become accustomed to noticing space. And again, through practice of the subtlety of releasing, you can release even that sense of space. And, and I mean, try to like imagine nothing, try to like think of nothing. I mean, but that imagining process will be active, but this just oh, spaceless, dimensionless. It's very, it's very hard to describe. Perhaps there's people who could describe it better than I could, but I understand why this sounds all. You, you objectify like the 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 realm of infinite consciousness, and by surrendering it, there's like nothing much left to the like world simulation that's going on, and so you know what's underneath infinite consciousness and in space is, is something more like nothing. Is that is that kind of the right direction? Yeah, it's not that you objectify because you could like objectify it but still be like maintaining it. It's that you you lose interest in it. Like stop spreading your attention outwards. You just release your attention even from that and put attention onto this like infinitesimally small no thing, nothing containing anything. I mean, it, do, it doesn't have. I'm, <laughs> I'm doing this because like there's this sense in which it sort of goes to like a singularity, mm. but it's not felt as like a dot. It's not felt like that. Um, and I'm trying my best to describe this. <laughs> Stuff gets hard to describe <laughs> at this point. Yeah. And then from seven to eight, you like. With seven, there's, there's still like a move you're doing. There's like a, there's a deliberate kind of move. It's hard to explain that move, but there is a, a movement and efforting in some way. And then you, you know, you do this and then to the point where you become absorbed in it and it sort of carries itself. But then eighth jhana is, it's even more releasing of trying to hold on to that nothingness and what it is is yeah the conceptual mind that could understand here or there or nothingness like that's been down regulated now and it's like you become in some way brain dead and <laughs> there's really at that point just you can only make sense of it after the fact once like the conceptualizing mind comes back online you can recognize that that happened what is the name of eight neither perception nor non-perception because you can't determine that it's an experience it's not a non-experience compared to like cessation or neurota samabadi but there's no conceptualizing mind happening in that moment so yeah it's like you couldn't even categorize it as like neither perception nor non-perception at that point could you talk a little bit about cessation and the other i think sanskrit word that i can't pronounce yeah so cessation is when the mind fully defabricates like fully lets go of everything everything and then this conscious experience shuts off there's, there's, there's a, a moment of no experience and i mean it's a fraction of a second and you know you have to that's why you have to have like the perceptual abilities to notice this happen but the the kind of the in and the out of it is a an eighth jhana like high quantumous total non-doing non-striving non-conceptualizing state of mind which i don't know it's it's almost like uh it could it could be perhaps that like i don't know incoming predictive models sort of like meet or the outgoing predictive models meet incoming uh, sensory data and they cancel each other out and then you'll be kind of in this like murky state and then suddenly you're just like super awake and super like on it again and this there's a sense of rejuvenation and that's the moment after cessation and this can happen a lot like you, these cessations can be quite frequent actually if you know how to look out for them and how to how to track them and get into them and then nirvana samapati is of the same type of cessation it's a non experience where consciousness shuts off but it's much longer in duration and to get into it, there's a lot more build up. Like you would go through the jhanas, like get really, really steeped in each jhana, go through them systematically, set the intention to do this, and you know, ha hands off the wheel at some point, let it all unroll, defabricate, and see what happens. And maybe I, I, I'm not, 
I've only done it a couple of times that I know, but so I'm not master of this. And that's like where consciousness shuts off for not just a fraction of a second, but it could be minutes. And apparently there are people who purport doing this for days. I don't know, I don't know about the validity. That sounds really interesting. It'd be cool to test them. Then on the reboot of that, that's like a much slower reboot where the fabrication process like can take like minutes like it's taken like like the first time i did it, it took me like 15 minutes to like come out and recognize and kind of remember my whole life because there is this sense of like you there was a kind of void a kind of it's a it's such a deep non-experience that it makes sleeping seem like really active in comparison there's a sense that like oh like there was a period of time like you hadn't even been born and you just suddenly like you just a like, being coming from nowhere and existing and you have to remember your whole life and it's just like what what is this world or like oh i have work tomorrow like what <laughs> yeah yeah the, the the void doesn't have work no no <laughs> <laughs> if we so if we could like all stay in the void i mean it's it's really the state of no suffering i mean it's it's the it's just the pinnacle non-experience experience and you get this like well that is it's like not preferable to just neurota summer party forever is because you become inoperable in that state you can't function and therefore you're not you can't be of service to help all the other suffering sentient beings like you you know you just dropping out i'm somewhat confused about your claim that it's so good given that there's no consciousness it's it's nothing it's really really nothing as much as nothing as you can conceive of nothing after the fact there can be a comparable judgment yeah. sure but that's a, I'm, I'm confused by that so is it your perspective that like even the sorry what was the word we were using earlier it's not resistance it's um the contraction it's your perspective that even the contraction necessary for like having a felt sense of body is enough suffering that like the oblivion of a cessation is preferable to any kind of sensation ever? What I think suffering is, is where there is suffering, there is a desire for it to not be there. No matter, you know, if it's, it's, it's bearable, you can live with it, you can rationalize it, you can justify it. No, ma no matter how minute the suffering is, that comes with a, an urge, a desire for it to not be there by, by dint of what suffering is. Yes, yes, yes. But we can, we can greatly reduce our suffering and, yeah, I mean, live lives where it's, it's so minimal that it's like hardly, hardly a problem. I mean, it can always be like, oh, it could always be less or better, but it's like compared to what a lot of other people have to go through. And this is like, yeah, this is, this is um, really nothing to complain about. But, but I think it just, this is what suffering by its nature is that desire for it to not be there. You can't suffer and like that suffering or enjoy that suffering that comes after the fact or that's a judgment after the suffering or that's trying to contextualize the suffering but suffering in and of itself is that wish for it to not be there sorry is it your perspective that a cessation is pr preferable to like defabricated consciousness uh cessation is the conclusion of this defabrication right but then there's no consciousness right yeah yeah. Oh, oh, so you mean like um, states of mind where there's still conscious experience, but they're like highly defabricated uh, in comparison to normal waking, walking about, talking states? Right. So, yeah. So like I, you know, so it sounds like you're in a very highly defabricated state of consciousness right now where there's much less suffering, but I'm trying to just pin down the, the phenomenology and like your ethics about, you know, why it sounds like you think that the the oblivion of a cessation is preferable even to a very highly defabricated consciousness. Yeah, I think it's locally preferable to the local bound organism, but pragmatically, yeah, you can't function in that state. So yeah, why is it preferable if it's like nothing? Subjectively, personally, yes, but it's only preferable in retrospect and in comparison to other states. So, but while it's there, there's there's no preference, preferencing, there's no judgment happening during it. I see. If it, it it feels like somewhat existentially like kind of pessimistic that like oblivion is better than like even extremely high defabric highly defabricated experience. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's a view that a lot of people wouldn't like the sound of it. 
But again, I, I really like uh, Rob Babeo, and he's got this soul making dharma where he talks about skillful fabrication, given like we have to function in the world. And it's like, let's make the existing conscious fabricated states of all sentient beings as pleasant or beautiful as they could be. Because we do, we can't just, I mean, you can, you can die at some point, in some ways, once you die, then you, you've dealt with all your problems. But that's not really a solution because there's still, and especially if you're going to notice the, the emptiness of the individual self, that it's not just your suffering that matters, it's everyone's suffering. Like there isn't a, a you, it's the universe is suffering. Like you haven't dealt with the problem of suffering by defabricating your consciousness or, or you dying. So while we're living in this world, let's help everyone else. Yeah, I know it sounds like a, a pessimistic view, but um, my, my life doesn't feel gloomy or stuff. I love laughing and uh, love comedy. I love music. I love spending good time with people and deep conversations. How does this all fit into the 21st century for you amidst uh, existential risk and artificial general intelligence and um, you know gene gene drives the 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 opportunities for improving the the fabrication and the the conditioning of experience that sentient creatures experience as well as how the the insights of undertaking the path and what one can learn about consciousness how that fits into our relationship and practice of technology. So I mean it's not obvious to me in all that humans have done we've progressed that we've positively changed the net balance of suffering on the planet like have we actually made it worse or have we made it better but and I, I, I don't know in which direction we'll go I think there's been I think a conclusion a lot of like big wigs in the scene are coming to is that okay we can spread these ideas and these practices through the internet that's been like an amazing thing and there's kind of this like there's like a new generation of meditators that are booming, but most people are still not in contact with this stuff. And even if they do, then they won't be motivated to start the, the practice. And even if they do practice, a lot of people don't get so far or, you know, and it's, it's difficult. There's going to have to be some kind of like technological invention. And I don't know what that will look like. Maybe some kind of combination of, uh, I don't know, brain scanning technology or in combination with 5-MeO-DMT dosing or something like that. It, there's also like the organizational problem of this that in some way when you become, I guess, less attached to things, you do lose a bit of a competitive edge. And I think the like the Genghis Khans and the Alexander the Greats and the Napoleons of the world weren't like big into this sort of like non-egoic framing of things and stuff like rather actually like evolution will select more for those kind of, the kind of people that change the game for all of us have massive egoic drives and like really want to replicate and leave their dent in the world and, and, their, and their legacy and that's something i think us those of us on on from another perspective will need to recognize and, and work with yeah <laughs> yeah well, <laughs> I, for, for, for all sakes and purposes, I'm team consciousness. Yeah, well, yeah, one facet of AGI risk that I'm interested in is part of creating AGI is also that we're creating the next generation of basically sentient minds. And so information and insights that we can take from meditation practice that can inform the creation of the kinds of minds that AGI have, assuming that they're like existentially safe, could be a really great way of reducing suffering and ensuring that maybe even like morality of systems, given that like suffering often produces like some of the worst behavior in both animals and human beings. So, you know, what's your perspective on carrying insights from the path over to architecting new minds? And then it sounded like there was something else that you, you had been thinking about. Yeah, like on this line of thought, I think one of the biggest fears about AGI is that we'll be creating a super intelligent being that is potentially not conscious and not and therefore not sensitive to valence. So it's got amazing measuring capabilities and, and, and replicating building capabilities, but it's like a super intelligent psychopath that, you know, processes information 10,000 times quicker than, than us. And, and it can make copies of itself and it doesn't need to eat and it doesn't need to sleep or drink. And if that's the case, that's super scary because you could have something that's just run amok and is blind to the fact that it's causing a lot of negative valence in the in the process but 
is that even possible? Or at a certain level of intelligence, you just must learn about valence and encounter valence. Or I had this idea that, you know, perhaps we could create like AGI bodhisattvas that would do a much better job of positively reducing the, the net balance of suffering on the planet at a, a much better way than, than humans ever could. And if they if they're not sentient and they don't know suffering themselves, well, is there like a one-to-one -one correlate of suffering that they could scan for, like, say, symmetry, taking from QRI, um, symmetry theory of valence, for example. And then its job is to make the universe as symmetrical as possible. And this might, it doesn't know that it's reducing suffering, but it does the job. What this brings up for me is this facet that we were talking about earlier, which was the relationship of truth to freedom from suffering. And one facet of the, the Waken perspective that I liked that you were discussing was killing yourself or defabricating your own experience doesn't totally take care of the problem of suffering because like the universe is suffering from the, the, the Awakened perspective. It's like neither self nor non-self, but there's this reality of suffering. And so, you know, a component to the past and a component to, you know, mitigating the risks of psychopathic AGI or AGI that lacks empathy is also seemingly like th these, these truths about no self and impermanence and suffering, you know, leading to a perspective of the, the universe as suffering. Because, you know, it seems like there's something about the psychopathic agent or the agent which lacks empathy is almost like failure of recognition of truth rather than it being like a some sort of like arbitrary property of a mind it's actually like the mind's failure to see clearly is is that a perspective that you think matches you know the path and your understanding of the dharma yeah 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 i could be uh, definitely agreeable with that perspective that i mean suffering is a feature of reality and it's just another thing to detect it's not some i mean it's just like you can have machines that can't detect certain colors or wavelengths suffering is another parameter to perhaps uh, ignore or be sensitive to all right roger well i'm i'm mindful of the time here uh you've been very generous with yours if people want to get in contact with you or to check out your writings where's the best place to do that i, I think you also offer one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching sessions so how should people uh you know reach out to you or get more information yeah, yeah. Um, I'm still pretty new to this scene and like trying to like, I don't know, put out contact places to reach me. At the moment, I've just got like a Facebook page. I need to build a website that'll come later. But uh, yeah, I've got a Facebook page. Um, you can message me on Discord or I have a website called meditative.dev and we have a, a meditation group there. And uh, we've also got a YouTube channel where I upload like guided meditations, meditative.dev. That's about it. All right, Roger. Well, yeah, thanks for coming on. I'm really appreciative of you sharing uh, the perspectives about how to do inquiry as well as the jhanas. These are like, you know, qu quite obscure things that I think your work and the work of people like you is really helpful for making them more clear and accessible. So thanks for that. And thanks for coming on. Yeah, I hope I'm adding to clarity, <laughs> universal clarity here. Thank you very much for the invitation, Luke. It's really, really appreciated. This is fun. Thanks for tuning in. If you found this episode valuable, you can help support the show by joining us on Patreon. Link in the description. There you'll be able to get access to additional benefits that aren't available publicly. And if you haven't already, you can subscribe to this show on YouTube or on your preferred podcasting platform by searching for Mew.